everything was quite messy. It was really dusty, so you couldn't go there with polished shoes and walk out and still have polished shoes at that time. And it was a food production company, so it was really, really dusty. The newest machine was 50 years old. Most other machines were much older than that. But not only the machines were old, but also the maintenance people, so the contractors. One was 73 and the other one was 85. These two guys, I asked them, so what is your succession plan? The 85-year-old told me, no worries. And I said, yeah, but what does it mean, no worries? He said, no worries. In November 2020, United States voters will once again elect the next president. Now, I have a question for our listeners from all over the world. Can you think of one product that all 45 U.S. presidents might have consumed? Any guesses? Well, you'll find out one possible answer very soon. In this episode of Family in Business, we are going to do a deep dive into the story of our very first family enterprise leader and his business that's not U.S.-based and not even multi-generational yet. My name is Esther Choi, the executive producer and your host of the John L. Ward Center for Family Enterprises' own podcast series, Family in Business, a podcast that features stories of leaders, their families, and the family enterprises they transformed. Today, we have the opportunity to hear the unlikely and fascinating journey that Andreas Kuster has taken on from donning suits to donning aprons and leading this 267-year-old company that his biological ancestors did not begin. But first, let's find out who is Andreas. So my name is Andreas Kuster. I'm an entrepreneur and our company is called Jacobs Basler Leckerli. The company got founded in 1753. It's a cookie manufacturer. As a matter of fact, it's the oldest cookie manufacturer of Switzerland and the third oldest in Europe. The company was one of the pioneers at the time when cookie production came up. It was not the first one, but part of this first group, but the only one which survived. If you put that into the historic context, this was before the U.S. Revolution took place, or in other words, each of the 45 U.S. presidents could or might even have eaten our cookies. Ah, they might have. That's a very compelling idea. And although we won't be able to prove that, it is beside the point. Because through Andreas' family enterprise story, we get to explore three important and very relevant concepts to family in business today. Number one, passing on the entrepreneurial gene. Number two, selling off is not necessarily a sign of failure. Number three, what playing the long game requires. First, let's hear more of Andreas' story how he came to own and run the oldest cookie manufacturer in Switzerland, and how come he's actually not one of a long lineage of owners for this legacy brand. It was always my childhood dream to have my own company. Both my grandparents had companies. In one case, on so my father's dad, it was easy. The company was not going really well. The best decision was to sell it just to protect the family assets. My mom's dad was a, a shipping company. The thinking process, you need very specific know-how to be successful in, in, in a very tough business environment. My grandfather's two son, nor my mom, none of them wanted to take over this company. Both companies got sold before I had an opportunity to have a word in. Even though Andreas couldn't and didn't have a chance to inherit one of the businesses his grandparents started, at least, he got to inherit their entrepreneurial gene. What's entrepreneurial gene? Out as the executive director of the John L. Ward Center for Family Enterprises, Professor Jennifer Pentecost, to elaborate exactly what it is. I think of it this way. If you grew up in a household where 
you got used to the security and the idea of what creates safety and financial security for a family is a routine check coming from some large entity that provides insurance and all these other supporting mechanisms, then that's the framework you view the world. And I think entrepreneurs have a very different framework, right? They rely on themselves to generate income. And that's from the beginning, right? This is different once a business becomes established, but that initial person takes a risk and goes out and bets on themselves and builds something. And that to me is the entrepreneurial gene. And, you know, a lot of kids from an early age are sent the message, you should do something that will ensure financial security. You should do something that will minimize risk versus you should go out and you should build something. I kind of heard these tones in the conversation with him, right? Is that I always thought I would own something. I always thought I would build something. That's not something you hear from everyone as a young person, right? Somewhere that idea came that I always thought I would do this. About six years ago, my wife Charlotte and I, we moved back to Basel where both um, were born and raised. That's Basel, Switzerland, where the company is headquartered in. And then I told her, now I will start to realize my childhood dream and I will look for a company which we could possibly develop together. At that point, I had an incredible cool position at Swiss Re, that's a leading reinsurance company. It was a pretty big change when I started looking and then about three and a half years ago, we took it over and since then we are developing it. By it, of course, Andreas is referring to Jakob's Basla Leckerli, the oldest cookie manufacturer in Switzerland. With such a long and unique history, I imagine it had to have a lot of interested buyers. So how did Andreas become the ultimate winning bidder? To be quite honest, this company was completely run down by the time we found it. And we did not even know exactly the history of it and everything. We, we had some bits and pieces, we had some fragments, and we knew that the owner, we had the impression that the owner is older. He was in a final stage with three other interested parties. So one was um, a member of a very, very fortunate family in Switzerland who planned to acquire this company probably as kind of a hobby for his wife. Another one had a, a food production company and just wanted to get access to this brand and they have incredible distribution channels. They could have made a beautiful company out of it as well. And the third one was um, more had a background like I had. He was in the IT industry, linked to food, but um, he really wanted to go back to basics and was looking something similar I want to develop. And then one day, it was on March 5, 2016, Charlotte told me, now just call her. She cannot more than hang up uh, the phone, And um, but you might be sad if it gets sold um, before you called. And so I picked the phone. And I, I called the owner and I told him, I hope that I'm not too aggressive, but I would like to ask you if you are interested in selling. And this was after about two years of looking for companies and contacting many people and so on. And then this lady says, yes, why are you calling? And then I got so nervous. I have expected all kinds of, of bad words, but I didn't expect just a straight yes. So you were on the phone for about half an hour. We fixed an appointment and I think that was the key moment then this first appointment. I asked Charlotte to join this first meeting because as I said just before, I had a really cool position at Swiss Re. I earned a lot of money, I had a lot of fun, it was really cool. But I told her, if we are successful and we acquire this company, our family life will change. So you need to join me to I need to be sure that you are standing behind that. And so we walk in into this company. And the previous owner fell in love with Charlotte. Yes, the previous owner fell in love with Charlotte the first time they met. Charlotte was also pregnant with their first child. So the previous owner said... She said, I have seen so many people who would like to have my company, but there was never anybody coming as a couple. And my husband and I, we were leading this company as a couple and you're demonstrating that you could potentially uh, preserve that. What the previous owners so wish to preserve is that the company stay family-owned. 
and that the company's legacy and the people working for it be protected no matter what big changes the new owners have planned going forward. This is why we got the company. It was not a money game. It was, we did, were better equipped. Looking back, Andreas has really benefited from not having a say in his grandparents' decision to sell off their companies. And this is the second important and relevant point we are extrapolating from Andreas' story. Why is the decision to sell off businesses not a sign of failure? This was probably a good decision that you rather pass on money than a company nobody really wants to lead and develop give the freedom to every family member to do with this money what they would love to do. Hard to argue against that logic. In this case, though, should we still consider Andreas family, his parents, his grandparents, a family in business? I think sometimes you see families which are for generation governmental officials or army officers or factory workers or whatever, but there are also families which are for generation entrepreneurs who come out with, with new ideas for generations. Sometimes it skips a generation. For example, my father, he wasn't an entrepreneur, he was a lawyer. Difference between a lawyer and an entrepreneur, a lawyer sees risks and the entrepreneur sees opportunities. So sometimes it skips a generation, but ultimately you ha when you have this idea of creating something new and even a lawyer is not creating something new but he's at least preserving wells usually quite well if you have a family who does that for a generation i think this is a family in business which just see this entrepreneurial aspect a little bit um, everybody helps for a generation and they build up wells and this is a little bit what we do here our families are here in switzerland for many generations and build up different companies some of them still exist, the others don't, but this is a family in business. So the decisions for both sets of grandparents to sell off turn out to be very, very beneficial. And yet, sometimes that kind of decision can still be difficult because the perception of failure. Here, Jennifer explains why this view should be shifted. Business needs to be relevant to the marketplace and relevant to the family. So what I mean by that is, what if we're no longer the best person to provide this product or service to the market, right? Or what if the market no longer values what we do? That's relevance to the marketplace. I've often heard people say it this way, are we the best owner of this business? But relevance to the family as well. You know, what if this is no longer a business that anyone in the family is very excited about? Maybe it would be better off held by someone else. The good news is that by creating that business and owning it in the first place, you generated some wealth. So is it a failure to sell that and take that wealth as a family and redeploy it elsewhere? I would venture that it's not. And there are lots of families who choose to exit businesses, but then either redeploy that money into new enterprises or take the money and, and invest it in different ways or, or become very philanthropic. And those are all... Those all could be a way of fulfilling the purpose of the family. So the purpose of the family could be more broad than just owning this business. It could be contributing to communities. It could be ensuring that all the family members are secure. It could be ensuring that family members have the opportunity to fulfill their passions, which could be as missionaries around the world or as school teachers or whatever that may be. So the business, if you think of the business as a means to an end rather than an end in and of itself, then it's a tool to accomplish your purpose. And you could do that one way by continuing to own it, but maybe it could generate more value by someone else owning it. The decision by Andrea's two sets of grandparents to sell their respective businesses was separate and independent from each other. And yet they had a positive consequence of generating more options and freedom for their children and grandchildren. Andreas and Charlotte became direct beneficiaries, even though his grandparents were not around to witness the benefit of their wisdom. In fact, 
Thanks to them, in 2017, their grandson Andreas Kuster was off making his childhood dream a reality, a reality that is mixed with plenty of ups and downs. It's like falling in love. You only see the upside. You have no clue about the challenges, how complicated it is to fix these things. The fear came much later. So in the beginning, it was like a honeymoon. And then suddenly we realized it's、um, not the nicest environment. After two, three months, when we start to figure out all these challenges, how complicated it is to find somebody who can repair our machines. Everything was quite messy. It was really dusty, so you couldn't go there with polished shoes and walk out and still have polished shoes at that time. And it was a food production company, so it was really, really dusty. The newest machine was 50 years old. Most other machines were much older than that. But not only the machines were old, but also the maintenance people. So the contractors, one was 73 and the other one was 85. These two guys, I asked them. So, what is your succession plan? The 85-year-old told me, "No worries." And I said, "Yeah, but what does it mean? No worries?" He said, "No worries." It's difficult to recall exactly the sleepless nights. But what we lost about 10% of revenue in the first 10 months compared to the previous owner, and we were thinking that we are improving really big time. On one hand, so we were losing revenue, and on the other hand, our investment cost. Were just much higher than expected. I got home at eight o'clock in the evening and fell asleep、uh, while giving the milk bottle to our baby. And so the baby was crying because I was、uh, falling asleep <laughs> holding the baby in the hand. My wife was mad that I wasn't giving the milk, and she had a tough day as well. And then I woke up at one o'clock in the morning, thinking about all these challenges, how we can possibly fix this company. So it was a Pretty tough time by during the first ten months, and then suddenly growth kicked in. We were completely surprised by the Christmas business. So the first ten months we, we lost revenues, and and then we finished the whole year with twenty five percent ahead of the previous owner. So we basically in two months we we had an incredible season. So I had sleepless nights because we didn't know how to satisfy demand. So it was a new challenge, extreme from an emotional perspective, from not knowing to whom I could possibly sell to how can I possibly deliver. And so today it's a completely changed company. We have a lot of safety in the features, and、um, the machines are really maintained, and it looks different, it feels different. It, but that was really challenging in the beginning. So first year we had a. Despite the great Christmas and the good、um, revenue increase, we still had considerable loss. Second year we broke even, and then the third year was a really good year. That was 2019. So we put some money money into the bank. Unfortunately, like everybody, we got surprised by COVID-19. Things were looking so good for the business throughout 2019. Then COVID-19 hit. But as our third year was really a good year, we are now prepared and we can survive such a、um, situation now. 2020 we started really incredibly well, which helped us. So January and February were unbelievably good months for us, and then suddenly. In the beginning of March, all clients started、um, cancelling orders from a big book of orders to just really literally zero. This was really tough because all our major distributors, several of them were, were even closed, and and no events took place where they needed、uh, or required giveaways. So we reduced production. First, we We build up stock in February. I said there is something coming. Let's build up stock because you can keep our cookie easily for about four or five months. So let's build up the stock in case somebody falls sick that we have enough、um, in our stock. But then demand broke away, so we 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 had this huge stock and we didn't know how to sell it. Up and down, up and down. In some ways, 
Andrea's story is a fairly typical entrepreneurial story, but in another way, the essence of his story is really about being born into a family in business that has positioned him to set the right mindset so he can play the long game. And that's the third important and relevant concept to family in business today. Yes, the global pandemic has put an unfortunate brick on his business growth trajectory, but Andreas maintains a long-term view. One thing we did well at that point is we followed、um, Professor Rebello's advice. That's Sergio Rebello, professor of international finance at the Kellogg School of Management, where Andreas received his executive MBA. Some of them called that when the cookies were ready to be shipped, a special packaging, and they cancel the order. And we told all of them, "No worries, you can、uh, cancel your order. There are no fees. We will charge you." We were just really, really nice. This strategy, I think, paid out big time, because there was, for example, this one client. He ordered 100 big boxes. We were just about to ship it, and he calls in and said, "May I still cancel, or could you ship it to different place? And I will figure out to whom I could, could donate." We said, "Certainly, you can cancel. No worries. We very well understood your situation." I had no clue how how we will figure out our situation, but、um, so I can certainly understand your situation. But I knew that this particular client they usually order about 1,000 boxes for Christmas. And we were never asked to pitch for that order, so I told him、uh, we would like to pitch for Christmas. He said that's not in my hands, but I will certainly put a good word in. By now we want the the Christmas pitch. It's and these are not one、uh, thousand boxes, but one thousand four hundred boxes. So we cancelled for complimentary one hundred boxes and now get one thousand four hundred boxes. So this strategy really pays out if people are troubled. Just be nice with them, and it pays out in the long term. If you go back in, in history, our country was occupied by Napoleon. We had all kind of sickness, including the Spanish flu and cholera before that. Swiss history in the past few centuries was filled with foreign occupations, civil wars, and economic depressions. For example, in 1798. Forty-five years after the company was officially founded, France invaded Switzerland and occupied the city of Bern, which is just about sixty miles south of where the cookie manufacturer is located. According to Encyclopædia Britannica, the French treated Switzerland as a vassal state, plundering it and making it a battlefield in their conflicts with the Russian and Austrian enemies. And in 1830s and 1840s, Swiss people have to contend with civil wars fueled by religious conflicts, and then in 1870s, economic depressions, and then of course in the first half of the 1900, we had a global depression and two world wars, and the list goes on all the way till the present day, 2020. If the company that you own and run has lasted 267 years, it has seen quite a few crises, even if you haven't personally done so. So having this long view gives Andreas confidence. At one point, after all these crises, First World War, Second World War, and other other crises, the world goes on. I don't believe that there will be a period of thirty years of depression. I don't believe that, and even if if that is the case, there will be ways that you can navigate through. So, just continue to do what is right, and then you will survive、uh, even in these challenging times. What are the right things to do? In other words, if Andreas were to pass this oldest cookie manufacturer to his daughter, what would he advise her to do when she encounters another global crisis, such as the business challenges that result from the current pandemic that he is still battling at the time of this conversation? If you believe in the company, if you believe into the mark that you have a good product and that you have a stable environment, just continue and make sure that you have. Some money in the bank that you can invest, but just continue. We will survive it. We didn't stop any investments into infrastructure, for example. We just said, "Let's go on. 
let's in, invest into the infrastructure, let's invest into building capacity that when the party starts again, that we are ready. By now, I hope it's quite obvious that by entrepreneurial gene, we don't mean biological gene. Rather, it's all about the behaviors. And these behaviors can be passed down. Here's Jennifer again. I think there are a number of different ways that you can pass it down. And you can pass that down through the stories you tell about the founders of the business. You can pass it down through behaviors and watching and observing people. You can also be more proactive in later generations in passing it down by creating sort of structures and systems to do that, right? Maybe creating an investment fund that next generation members could apply to for money to try something new on their own. But the key is to remember for families that the history was about trying new things and adapting till you got it right and taking risks. Because I think a lot of people, once they get secure in a business that's larger and generating income, then they become more risk averse or they look to the legacy and they say, well, this is who we are, this is what we do. But truthfully, that changed a lot in the early years to figure out the formula to get it right. Uh, So how do you tell the stories about the family's entrepreneurial gene and the willingness to take risks and adapt? Great question, Jennifer. How do you tell those stories about the family's entrepreneurial gene? That will actually be in a dedicated episode in season two. For Andreas and Charlotte, they have a young child and a budding business enterprise. They are more than busy enough. So how do they tell the stories about their family entrepreneurial gene? You don't need to be a great writer or even a great storyteller to do so. But you do need time to reflect upon your stories. And here's how Andreas does it. The cookie we are producing today is a very typical cookie from our region. It's a little bit a gingerbread type cookie, contains about 40% of honey, but then it contains also candied lemon and oranges. It uh, contains some spices. As a little boy, it was a family tradition that the men in the household had to produce this type of cookie. So um, it was my brother and my father who baked these cookies uh, every year around Christmas season. And um, when uh, Charlotte and I got married, I told her that uh, now we are just the two of us, you have to help me. And that was the moment where our cookies got much better than everybody else in the family because Charlotte brought in the love and uh, I don't know, some special spices or something. Or something. The something, as you've heard through Andrea's story, are his grandparents' wide decision to sell off, pass on the capital as well as entrepreneurial gene to their descendants, and together with his wife Charlotte taking risk, believing in the market and products and maintaining long-term view of the business and its future. This wraps up our episode this month. Thank you again, Andreas Kuster, proprietor of Switzerland's oldest cookie manufacturer, Jakobs Basla Leckerli. Thank you for tuning in to Family in Business, a podcast sponsored by the John L. Ward Center for Family Enterprises at Kellogg School of Management. Our show is supported and advised by Dr. Jennifer Pendergast. Kane Power is our audio engineer. And I am Esther Choi, the executive producer, your host, and the author of the book, Let the Story Do the Work. Our next episode will be released in mid-November. This one will be a very special one. We have assembled a collection of leaders from very different family enterprises, but they've all studied and worked with John Ward, our center's co-founder, the renowned researcher, scholar, and teacher, and the person now the center is named after the John L. Ward Center for Family Enterprises. Each of our guests will share one specific thing they've learned from Professor Ward and how it has impacted them, their families, and their enterprises. Professor Ward is now retired. So whether you had a chance to work with him or not, this next episode will be packed with gems that you don't want to miss. We're so excited for this last episode for the season, and we can't wait to share with you. So see you in November.